I'm Donna Meltzer. I'm the CEO of the National Association of Councils on Developmental Disabilities, NACDD. We're all here together today to celebrate DD Awareness Month, DDAM. As part of our uh, myriad of uh, opportunities and events that we've held this uh, month, um, we today have a great panel of artists with disabilities for you. Um, to introduce them, I am going to uh, turn things over to Eric Stoker. Eric is uh, the information specialist with the Utah DD Council, and Eric also serves on the board of directors for NACDD. Eric, thank you for agreeing to serve as our moderator for today's amazing panel. I'm going to turn it over to you now. Great. Thank you, Donna, and welcome everybody to our panel discussion today on Conversations for the Arts. And as Donna mentioned, my name is Eric Stoker, and I'm the Information Specialist for the Utah Development Disabilities Council. And so, my, so we're going to go ahead and get started, and I'm going to have the artists actually introduce themselves and talk about their area and focus, and I'm going to start off with Allie. Um, hi, I am Allie Broderick. Um, I'm zooming in from Denver, Colorado. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I've never done anything like this before, so I'm very nervous. Um, <laughs> so um, I would say that, so I'm, I'm, I'm an artist with Access Gallery, um, and my focus is, um, I guess it, it um, sort of varies depending on what I'm expressing. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm very, very nervous. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I'm very organic with what I'm, I work with. Um, so I'm a painter, um, I'm also a sculptor, and um, I, um, it depends on what's been, what's been presented with, so, um, it tends to always be from an organic base. Um, and so that's kind of where I, yeah, it's where I come from, um, very organic. And um, that's my focus. Yeah, so. Great, thank you, Ali. Adrian? Hi, all. It's great to connect to you wherever you are in uh, the country or the world even. And I wanted to thank uh, Donna and Eric for organizing this incredible panel with such esteemed artists. I'm zooming in from Boston. My name is Adrian. I use he, him pronouns and those who might have uh, vision uh, impairments. I am an, an Asian male with um, slick back, uh, black hair, uh, brown skin, I am calling in uh, from my home on a relatively uh, sunny day with a smile on my face because it is such an honor to, to be here again. I'm a performing artist and an educator. My primary instrument is the violin. I was born without a right arm, uh, so that is a congenital uh, condition that I have lived with my entire life and I continue to perform around the country and uh, around the world, and also heavily involve myself in advocacy and education uh, within the inclusion context uh, for uh, musicians with a broad range of, of disabilities, uh, some of them including uh, developmental uh, delay and uh, some of the challenges that are being addressed within uh, this panel as well. Uh, so I'm very grateful again to be here and looking forward to this conversation. We're really excited to have you, Adrian. Welcome. Emily? Hi, guys. My name is Emily Crankin. I am a white woman with blonde hair, with blue eyes, and a pink floral blouse. And I am an actress. I'm in a movie on who to go best summer ever and I'm also in a short on in Sundance called Beep and My Back. I can't really say the voice out because you're all in a public place so I can't 
and I'm also a outfit advocate. I worked in, I worked actually at NACDD, so it's really good to see Donna again. And right now, I'm a sensibility assistant at a research company called Restat, and I'm also in Glasgow for disability studies. So, I'm, and I see some people in the chat, so hi guys, and I'm so glad to be here from Maryland. Great to have you with us, Emily. It's amazing. Precious? Hi, everybody. Super excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Precious Perez, and I, um, I'm a Hispanic woman with curly hair. Uh, right now, it's on top of my head. <laughs> and I'm in my, at my desk in my room. Um, I am a singer-songwriter, multi-instrumentalist, and a general music educator. Um, right now, I teach part-time elementary general music. Um, in addition to pursuing my artist endeavors and then also advocacy um, around disability in the music industry. Um, Adrian and I are both a part of an organization called RAMPD, um, Recording Artists Music Professionals with Disabilities, um, very focused on advocacy and inclusion. Very exciting. Um, but my focuses are kind of in a couple different areas, but very passionate about just advocacy and um, you know, inclusion in the world for students with disabilities, for musicians with disabilities, um, and just conquering the world together. So excited to be here and thanks again. Our pleasure, Precious, and welcome. So my first, so my next question for our panelists for today Uh oh, thank you, folks. Eric, you froze there for a minute. I don't know if you can hear us. Hopefully you'll come back quickly. Donna, did you want me to ask a question? Okay, never mind. Wait, I think Eric's back, but thank you. Sorry, my, my we're having, I'm having Wi-Fi issues. My computer does not want Speaking of, <laughs> my Wi-Fi issues. Okay, Eric, you're back. We didn't get to hear your question. So can you repeat, please? Yeah, my computer is having issues today. Sorry, guys. So my, my first question is, um, what does being an artist, a musician, and an actor mean to you all? Who wants to start us off? I can go first. I think okay. that the, the key point in a lot of these discussions is that the identity of an artist or, or musician doesn't change based on the context of how we're labeled within um, sort of a disability framework. I think that for me in particular, just like the rest of my colleagues uh, in the professional world, uh, being an artist it has so many different dimensions to it. I think one is uh, on a very base level, a profession, something that we uh, use to be able to pay our bills, to be able to live and and really just make a living uh, and, and to contribute to uh, not only our local communities uh, through creativity and, and our gifts, but also hopefully the uh, larger sphere and, and the world as well. I think that music in particular is a language that is very much like a passport that allows us to really cross borders, cross identities, cross uh, different ways of believing to uh, try to find, um, I won't even say like, I think this is a misnomer, this universal truth, but to speak to our truth and uh, for others to be able to find a greater understanding about themselves and a different perspective uh, within the world. Uh, and, and music, uh, is merely a vehicle and a discipline to be able to achieve that. We work mainly within the, the craft, crafting of the air around us through pitch, rhythm, uh, texture, and sound. 
and at the same time i think what we're trying to do is express our identities and our stories uh in a way that mm, is continually different every day and like i work in the classical sphere so when i play a piece by mozart for instance uh how it sounds today versus how it will sound tomorrow uh might be completely different and i think that being part of uh or part of being a musician is really using the craft to to hold a mirror to uh myself as as a human uh and to really just use it as uh, almost like a relational tool to be able to really just find my footing and place uh within this world i mean i think especially growing up differently or just having a unique perspective on having limb difference for instance that uh, feels very comforting uh, to me not only as a practice but something that i have the privilege of being able to claim as a profession too yeah as a Actress who, who hopes to focus on musical theater. I also do it in that sense. So I can confirm what Edwin says is true about the importance of music and the language and the pitch and the skits and what you need to do to really communicate with the world through music. And like when we read some whatever's a musical and we go through the music and for acting it's a media that we are finally getting the wide um, representation of it like Cola is about to win the Oscar for best picture and best winning actor next week so it's something that we are quickly catching up on and in Job and companies like respectability really elevate these able artists like myself. And for me, in virtuality, I finished graduating in a conservatory after I was invited to audition for it. And that means the world is changing. And it's a, it's a disabled actress in the wider that has gotten a start in the inst industry through the rest of whatever and verb and this is in hard work and luck it's up to me that to keep the world going and to collaborate with my other actors and next week you know no two weeks of starting the, the annual Easter Sears Disability Film Challenge and even though I can't do it this year due to Glass Girl and her planned weekend trip, it is a symbol of how many disabled actors. And actually, I'm insisting it does the music for the move or the movies, how that door is opening among others. Yeah, I really love what you said there um, about the world changing and we're seeing it happen and I think for myself as an artist and musician as well um, to add to what Adrian said it is a vehicle um, for all of these things and for me even like change and it's a vehicle for unity um, and you know when we have so many intersections as people multiple identities that come together through our art uh, we can uplift and elevate those communities and really bring people together. So I think for me, um, music and artistry really represents the ability to unify and to change uh, through self-expression and coming together with others. Yeah, I, I mean, you guys are stealing all my words here. You know, what do I say? <laughs> um, I do want to quickly um, apologize for um, not introducing myself very well. Um, I've never done this kind of forum before. And so you also beautifully described yourselves and um, I didn't do that. And so um, I did not know that that was something that I should have done. And so 
um, I do want to apologize for that. I, I have autism and so I don't always know that I'm supposed to describe things. It's not something that I, I do well. Um, however, I'm not going to backtrack on that, but I just wanted to own that and just let everyone know that it's not something I'm very good at. Um, but I do want to stay on point with what we're talking about right now. And what I would like to add is that for myself, what I do, thank you, <laughs> what I do want to um, speak to is that throwing in on what you've already all articulated, I love that the, on, on a personal level, what I've discovered as someone who's a little bit older than you, just a little tiny bit, um, is that I didn't have some of the experiences that you're sharing. And so what I think I can add to this is that having found art as an older person, um, I'm 52 and I didn't have art. I didn't have those things. Um, I discovered that the color that I can see now and, and experience um, through Access Gallery, which is a wonderful nonprofit that brings art to people with disabilities. Um, and it offers the opportunity for artists to um, make changes and have the opportunity to be treated as professional artists in, the, in their community, I think is, is what you're all describing through music and your art form um, is what I'm getting to witness now. And I'm just starting out with those guys and it's just incredible. So I just wanted to share that with you all on my side of things and so. It's just wonderful to hear you all speak from your, your points of view. So thank you. Thank you, Ali. So the next question I have for our panelists is, who are your biggest artistic influences? So I remember when I first was going to learn a musical instrument, our music teacher, uh, set aside this like big box of like just a, what is this going to be what are we going to play sort of deal and i was very excited to see what was going to be the the big reveal because i i liked music when i was younger and liked to sing and i thought okay well it'd be nice to be able to start an instrument so she opened the box and out came a recorder and very quickly i felt deflated because I realized I wouldn't be able to play all the notes with my hands. So my parents uh, started looking for different options. Uh, one was the trumpet because it would be easy to hold up with one hand. And we realized very quickly it was a little too loud for our house and uh, decided, OK, maybe not. So singing was another one. It was like just I didn't have a great voice or maybe um, I thought I had a great voice, <laughs> but my parents didn't. Uh, they didn't tell me at that time, though. And, and then finally, I was watching Sesame Street, and there was this clip of a violinist who was struggling to get up the stage with a pair of crutches. And I remember that he had braces on his legs, and every single step was labored and I was just like glued to the screen because there's a violin at the top of the stage and he puts down his crutches he sits down picks up the violin and plays the most incredibly beautiful um, passage on the violin I'd ever heard and it was super virtuosic and uh, and uh, difficult and I quickly said, wow, that's really amazing to see someone who is utterly transformed by just having a tool that they found accessible uh, in their lives and they were able to express their imaginations. Uh, this person's name was Ishak Perlman, who is a multiple 
Grammy Award winner. He's played in a lot of, of mute movies, uh, uh, most notably ones by like Steven Spielberg in, in um, specifically, and is just one of the renowned virtuosos, regardless of of his uh, disability, which was polio and uh, just having uh, troubles just navigating the world uh, and mobility challenges. So I think that he always remained uh, my inspiration because he, uh, it wasn't that he was hiding his disability at all. He was walking up proudly uh, on that stage and, and just this, idea of him having that courage to just express his truth is something that uh, continually uh, inspires me as a human uh, as much as a, a musician because he's just a fantastic player uh, to listen to. Uh, so that would be my my first uh, inspiration and then he eventually became my teacher uh, when I was a teenager and that was just like full circle sort of deal. But if you haven't had a chance, uh, Ishchak Perlman is his name. Uh, I'll put that in the chat later. An incredible violinist. For me, I definitely have to say I struggle because he's literally the first ever physically disabled Tony winner. And you know, no, no, she the first physically disabled Tony winner. She was the first witch, I can see the witch on Broadway. Period. So, because of her, you know, there can, there can be someone like me on Broadway and actually there was. And when the Christmas Carol was on Broadway before the shutdown, the two tiny terms had several posse. Like me, and it's like, now that could happen with me as well, and actually, it was the only in today that Coda is going to be a musical on Broadway after a year. So, you know, anything that could happen on stage. And another influence for me is Jerry Jude, because she's the first out of service to Pussy on TV. She has, you know, my hands, she has my walk, my limp. She has my voice, and here she was in the seventies on TV, and she's going pretty strong today. And and I'm just and she was like the only one that could, that could find a work at that time, and that her and somebody with Down syndrome, I forget his name, but without them, I probably wouldn't be an actress today. That's amazing. <laughs> um, I think for me, as far as artistic influences, um, it's kind of all across the gamut. Um, I mainly focus on pop, R&B, and Latin music. Um, so people like Daddy Yankee, people like Alicia Keys, uh, Tori Kelly, um, a bunch of different uh, inspirations um, that I've had since I was very young. Um, but I think as far as people with disabilities um, in th what I do, um, you know, when people think of, you know, blind musicians, um, they think, you know, Stevie Wonder and Ray Charles. They were the first two, like, blind musicians to really be seen in the mainstream. Um, and they really inspired me to move forward and to to showcase like you know there are a lot of us and we all deserve to be seen um not just those two you know and we we um have the ability to have our own identities and move forward as our own artists um you know for me I'm, i want to be you know recognized as a blind woman musician in this industry um at the forefront so that is something that I was inspired to do by um, seeing their legacy and what they were able to achieve. I really, really like that Precious very much. Um, that's a very powerful statement. Um, I, 
I have enjoyed a lot of artists that I have seen. And if I could name them all, we'd be have a very long evening ahead of us. Um, so I'm gonna keep it pretty simple. Um, I'm inspired every day that I walk into Access Gallery and those young people that I am around are my inspiration right now. Um, most of them have uh, developmental disabilities um, and they are so talented. They blow my mind every single day. I cannot wait to go in and work with them. They make me smile, they make me laugh, they inspire me to work my butt off. And so I also really like Frida Kahlo. And I love nature. And those are my inspirations. So. That is awesome, Ellie. You just answer our next question. Then the next question for our panelists is, where do you find inspiration? I find inspiration in my books to know alive because I am, I'm not getting any distance right now, unfortunately. I am trying to write my own scripts of short movies so that I can Still in because the word is if you cannot find anything, any work, you do it yourself, which sucks, but that's the way how it goes. And for that, I am like, I'm, 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 no, I'm saying, I'm going through my own life with my scripts, like me being single at 28, I'm going for school therapy. Me having to be a mother, or that would be like as a disabled woman. So I find the reason of everyday life was on TV, what comedies are there. I'm a job right now, I'm writing scripts for some projects, so I'm like tapping into the office for that and see what that is like. That's amazing. Wow. Um, <laughs> so powerful, everything you just said. And I feel like just to kind of add to that, for me, inspiration is, you know, seeing people like you, like working to tell your story and, and to pioneer in your field. Um, a lot of my inspiration comes from, you know, my life as well. Um, things I go through, sometimes I'll get like a song idea by you know hearing a rhythm or a melody in a different song or going through something and being um in a place where i say wow that was a really good line that i didn't mean to say like I'm, i'll be in a conversation and i'll say something and i'm like that's quotable i should definitely use that in something um or sometimes it's people around me i see people around me doing a certain thing uh getting elevated to a certain level and i say you know how did you do that how can we get more people at this level and how can we help each other grow and expand and just really um it inspires me to lift other fellow artists up and then also in turn be lifted and elevated by them and what they do um really powerful just life experiences and um, learning from everybody around me. Precious, I think that's a, a beautiful articulation and I equally uh, echo the inspiration that we have uh, in this panel and, and the uh, different artistic disciplines that you have uh, continued to find excellence uh, within, which makes me uh, remind myself that inspiration also comes from stillness and and just being an open vessel. I think that as artists, we're pressured to produce so much. It's like, what do you have to say? And then the burden is incumbent upon us to be able to be inspirational, <laughs> especially when you intersect that within like the context of disability, it's something that I certainly had a lot of tensions uh, growing up with, like, am I a classical musician first? Or am, am I getting gigs because I have one hand, for instance, and people want to 
uh, leverage that image in order to feel better about the world. And I, I think it's a, a great framing of a question of like what inspires us. Um, and as Precious was just sort of saying, and, and Ali as well, like just uh, being still with our surroundings and understanding that like even all of us within our spaces, wherever you are, uh, in your rooms or in front of your computers, if we just take 15 seconds even of just like breathing out and just like letting things in, uh, I feel like that is such a useful tool for me when there's just so much stress to be inspirational or to produce something that feels like it's inspired in a creative act. Uh, and that's so important as we continue our process just to let go and to be a sponge. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, just everyone in the panel just for bringing that up. All right, let's head on to our next question. Uh, the next question is, does art help you oh, Ali, in other areas Ali, of your life? Oh, Ali didn't um, answer yet. Oh, Ali, did you have another? Sorry, Ali, did you have another? Um, did you, where else do you find inspiration? Ali, you've mentioned um, the people you walk into your art access gallery, but what else gives you inspiration? Yeah, I, well, I think I kind of did. I, I didn't really have so much to add in the sense I, I think I got lost in listening to everybody. <laughs> but thank you so much, Emily. I, I really think that I, I leave it with nature, honestly, that I just feel that that's okay. I will just leave it with my surroundings and yeah. But thank you, Emily. You're wonderful. Thanks, Emily, for catching me on that. I almost forgot, Ali. I'm so sorry. Alrighty. So the next question I have is, does art help you in other areas of your life? I can speak quickly on this. I don't know if I can separate my life out of art. And I think all are, are so intertwined that it's hard to know sort of what, where the art ends and then other aspects of life begin. And yet at the same time, I imagine that there are subconscious ways of being and observing and and uh, perceiving that are practiced in a disciplined way, sort of like a muscle uh, that will allow me to uh, experience something that might not necessarily feel artistic in a certain context, but uh, actually is. Uh, so I think that's just sort of my general response, because I think that in every aspect of of activities that I believe we do as humans, just the act of just navigating world second by second is a is a creative act. Uh, we sometimes don't know what we're going to do next as much as we try to schedule ourselves and sort of say we're going to do this from this time to this time. Yeah. What we do within those spaces of time are, are very similar to like if you have a piece of music and what do you do from one note to the next or one bar uh, to the next there's just such a uh, art reflects life and life reflects art um, connection that I feel there. Yeah, Adrian, I really resonate with that because <laughs> for me it's it's almost like you know how does how do you have one without the other um it's so integrated uh, as you said i think a lot of it um in, in the sense of other areas i think for me art is an outlet too so it's cathartic to sometimes like if i don't know how to handle a situation to write about it or turn it into art um whether you know it gets put out to the world or not that's a separate thing um sometimes it doesn't sometimes it doesn't uh, but being able to process things in a healthy way um using art i think is really helpful um having that outlet um and that place for it um 
I think that's really all I can, you know, off the top of my head, just say about how it helps. Um, but I think sometimes it can also, um, you know, be a stressor, like what Adrian said before, like to produce and to be inspirational. So um, sometimes it it can um, be good to just not put any pressure on ourselves and just let ourselves be for a little while. Um, that's kind of a place I'm in right now where I haven't created anything new in a few months. Um, and if I sit and think too long, I'm like, oh my goodness, when am I going to create anything new? Do I still know how to create something new? Like, <laughs> so it's definitely a process. Um, but I think that's where life comes in and you just kind of realize, you know, the things that you do next can inspire the next thing and you just don't even know yet. So it's definitely a balance and it's also a give and take. Yeah, what they said pretty much. <laughs> I think I think um, it is a tricky one. This question it's it's a very interesting question because I feel like for me, since art came to me later in my life, um, I feel like if I trust it and I just do it and, and like I shut up and I get out of the way, um, I. Um, I feel like the process helps me communicate things that my, you know, my, my speech can't let me do, if that makes any sense. Um, so my art can communicate things that I can't do. And so that can be incredibly helpful. Um, but if I get in the way of it, then it all creates a big old mess and then it's too forced and it's I, I become an an object of destruction <laughs> so um yeah so if I if I can just trust it then it it's wonderful but if, yeah so I think we're all saying the same thing in our own ways and that's what's very great about this whole conversation so thank you thank you Ali and that leads us to our next question um did your disability ever get in the way of your art or did it inspire your art? But definitely both for me. You know, I always, you know, most 99.9% of the actors I've seen are not physically disabled. Or they, they don't seem to be, you know, most of them they are, you know, mentally disabled. So I always think, what if I didn't have a disability? What if I had a regular voice? What if I could, like, you know, seen the way I seen because I had a regular voice? Then, and what would it become my career? Would I be successful in New York? Would I be a university of major in college? Would I be this or would I be that? Would I get more distance on actors' assets or whatever? But at the same time, my disability gave me my movie. They gave me my awesome friends. They gave me my agent right away. That's why I got my agent and got agent to because I'm disabled. And, you know, as a disabled person, I do write my stories about my disability. So in a way I got mm, those that are very well to me as a disabled human being. Yeah, this is precious. I definitely agree with you, Emily. It's both. Um, there have been times where, you know, I audition for gigs or I audition for a show or something and, you know, I'm wondering if the reason I didn't get it is because I look too different or if it's because, you know, I can't do something as quickly as someone else or, you know, and I would, when I was in an acapella group for a time, like when they did choreography, was I holding everybody back and that's why we couldn't learn it fast enough. Um, 
So there are definitely moments like that, but at the same time, I'm now in spaces uh, because of my disability where I have the chance to advocate um, and help set the trail for other people with disabilities that are trying to do what I'm doing. Um, and that's really powerful in itself to be working with so many amazing people. Um, and, you know, to have opportunities like being here with all of you right now, talking about this and sharing our experiences is so powerful. And, you know, that wouldn't necessarily be the case, I don't think, if I, if I didn't have a disability. So I think it can definitely be both. Um, but there is, a, you know, there's something to be said for perspective um, and, and how we are able to overcome all of that. This is uh, Adrian speaking. Uh, thank you for that, Precious. And and Emily, and I think that I echo a lot of the both uh, and situations in terms of disability identity. And I can sort of speak from personal experience. After I graduated, I was continuing to play as a soloist uh, with a lot of orchestras and uh, it was very visible sort of within the music scene and for a lot of classical violinists like myself in order to have a sustainable career some people go down sort of like the gig path and want to be able to just take things here and there build out your network sort of deal and then there are other folks who want to have a little bit more stability in their lives and they join an orchestra and uh, have a regular gig and then they can sort of do some other stuff on the side. So I think that for, for, for my personality, I didn't like to travel as much and like I wanted to sort of just have more of a normal musical existence. So I started auditioning for orchestras and I think it was an interesting irony because orchestras um, started putting up screens uh, in front of the musicians to uh, avoid gender bias in particular. And, and that was great uh, for just creating a, a more uh, fair sense of equity within the audition process uh, because people audition with their eyes as well. And so I found it a little ironic that um, the way that I bow produces a somewhat different technique. Uh, so my like, short notes or my long notes or the transition between those notes sound unique in a artistic way that I've incorporated into my artistic identity. But behind a screen where the idea is to like, can you sound uh, or be a, a part of a larger group where everyone is using their bows in the same way with their fully grown hands? That was not something uh, that I was able to do. And the irony behind that, at least for me, was that uh, orchestras that I was playing as a soloist with, like if I were behind a screen, all of a sudden that became a detriment because um, my sound production was just a little bit different. So I think it just speaks to this tension of being unique and having your own story to tell. And at the same time, understanding that there are aspects of the music industry that are very different than like being a musician because there is a normalizing sort of factor of like of what sells sort of deal or, or what works within sort of larger institutional context and for me it definitely was um something that i could assimilate to or something that i would just have to say well maybe this isn't the right space for me and and as ali was saying um sometimes like we get in our own ways and we become agents of destruction. <laughs> I really like that. And I really do feel like that destruction could be your own artistic identity and self uh, so that you can feel like you fit in with other people. So it has been a continual journey to find that balance for me by sort of knowing how to get out of the way as, as Ali was saying, being selfless and just being that vessel for the art to come. And also sort of being true to who I am and, and using that as sort of the building blocks of construction for an artistic identity as well. Um, I feel like it's, 
it is both. I, it's it's definitely both. Um, for myself, I feel like, um, you know, I, again, I'm going to use the later in life thing, but it is true. I was diagnosed with autism uh, later. And so for a lot of my life, I was masking um, and living my life, just going, what is going on? Like, why? why do I not fit in this world? I don't know what's happening to me. And so I, my exec, executive functioning is, it was, is just very, very bad. <laughs> and so, but I did not know what was wrong. I, I always felt like I just could not function in this world. And so once I got diagnosed, I was like, oh, okay, well, this makes a whole lot of sense, you know? And so it was very, actually, it was very freeing, but it also um, created a lot of self-doubt in myself. So my point is that it, that was the, the dichotomy um, that created um, that feeling of, it got it, the disability got in the way, but it also created um, that feeling of, yes, it got in the way, but it also allowed me to, um, to feel that it, it caused struggle, but once I was able to, to feel that, that I could finally breathe and know that there's nothing wrong with me, you know, it's okay. Um, this is why I am the way I am. And that, um, you know, my brain is my brain and that's okay. And then I started creating this, this art and I feel like my, my art is, I get lost in it. And I create this art with this vivid imagination that I have. And so that's where I feel like that dichotomy is, is, you know, this, this versus this, you know, and so that's why um, I see it on both sides. So. That is awesome, Allie. So my next question I have for our panelists is, where do you see yourself within the art community? active um if i'm not doing if i'm if, if i become very experienced in movies tv and theater i would just love to teach younger disabled actors and i would love to to you know use my voice to advocate for Disabled actors on screen and behind the screen and on stage and off stage, along with other getting like more serious issues in real life. Yeah, this is precious. Um, oh man, that's a loaded question, <laughs> but I have a really big dream. And, you know, I'm, I'm working hard to achieve that dream, and that's to be the first um, blind Latina musician at the forefront of the Latin industry. Um, I, there, there's not enough disability visibility and representation in the music industry as is, and especially within the Latin music industry. Um, and it's something I'm very passionate about to be a part of, you know, that's part of one of my intersections and my communities and I think it's so important to um, you know show other disabled Latinas that like if this is what you want to do you can achieve it and you can accomplish it um, and to really help to give back to um, all of the disabled musicians that come after me um, to be able to mentor and to lead, as Emily was saying, just being able to help um, bring up the next generation. And, you know, as a music educator as well, I'm so passionate about teaching all students to be inclusive, to understand differences, and to follow their dreams all at the same time. Um, so those are kind of 
you know, where I am working toward um, in the art community. I think that the question is interesting, Eric, in terms of like, how do we sort of define our positionality uh, within our communities? And I think that changes contextually, just like how we are as, as citizens uh, in this world, as Americans, as artists, as, you know, for me at least, like uh, a male uh, navigating this space as well. Uh, and And I think that regardless of sort of the multiple identities and, and as Precious was saying, intersectionalities that sort of uh, come into sort of our entire being, I, I do feel like there's a way for an artist to be sort of nimble uh, within the center of a community and then to go to those margins. And, and to really explore and push and, and find ways to be daring. And I think that uh, one of the common themes I'm hearing throughout this entire panel is this idea of, of dichotomy, as, as Ali was saying, just sort of weaving in and out and, and really bringing the outside in as much as the inside out. I will say that uh, one of the best spots to be uh, as an artist uh, is in sort of like these cross sections of edges of different disciplines. So say for instance, um, for me, uh, I heavily involved myself in the uh, work between uh, disability education and, and technology. And really knowing that, for instance, in um, many educated systems, uh, special education is really uh, can be sort of at the margins within the general field. And then when you think about technology and assistive technologies, for instance, and like how we like use like uh, even our iPhones or just like common tools that are at our disposal now, this is also sort of like an edge and like where those two meet and sort of um, sort of create friction with each other, that's sort of where the artistic and creative mindset really sort of navigates really well within, because I think that at any sort of, how can I say, discrete discipline, there's like, say, for instance, you're a cook, you can be someone who does it for fun, you could be someone who is, is really good at it. And then there's some who just elevate it to like, just like when you taste that food, by an incredible chef. That is an expression that is emotional sort of deal. Uh, and I think that's the same in like, you know, the tech field and the education field. Uh, we can sort of uh, find ways as artists. I really just enjoy being at that level where regardless of sort of what our specialties are and sort of going deeper into those uh, fields that we find ways to sort of escape those silos and really find innovative ways to be able to, as, as Precious was saying, support young people, especially, or, or support sort of just where we are going or want to go as, as a field, as a society, as a country, as a species even. So I think art is very important in that aspect. Um, I, I see myself as, um, as an artist who is just going to continue learning every day. Um, I wanna to continue to be that sponge who will learn from my community um, and then continue to give back to my community. Um, I know that sounds very basic, but that is the core of it. I think that that's the most important thing that I can do and my goal then is to be um, a mentor to those younger people that I'm with at Access Gallery specifically, because they are my community. Um, and me being the, I think I'm the oldest one there, so that it, you know, which is an honor really, because I want to be a voice to um, younger people because I did not have that. And I think it's really important to learn from those things when you don't have something, I think it's good to be able to, to think about what, what you're gonna do with that then. You know, um, you learn from what you lived 
your life experience and you say, okay, so what can I take from that? What would have helped me? And then um, at least that's what I think. And so you take from that and you say, all right, what would I like to give to someone else? And so what I think is you give um, support, you give a chance to help them find their voice. And that's what I think is important. So that would be something that I would like to continue to do is to assist young artists with disabilities to find their voice, especially those with autism, because it's very difficult to use your voice um, and to feel confident to, um, to find it when it's difficult to have communication skills. So that's what I would like to do. Thank you, Ellie. So my last question for the, for the panelists is, what advice would you give to someone with a disability who likes to Well, I know the question is, what the advice you would say to young disabled people, it's really do it. Whatever it is that you want to do, do it. It's 2022, all of us have come to this really big dance that was in here like 31, 30 years ago. And it was changing, it's different. Uh, there was still obstacles, obviously, but just do it. Really, do it. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly with that sentiment. Go for it. Um, I would also add, like, it's not easy. It's not easy, especially if you're pioneering something and you're the first disabled person to do something. Um, it's, a, it's a hard road, um, but you're not alone in that. You know, we're all here um, and ready to support and just stay authentic, stay true to yourself, and don't let anyone tell you that you can't because you can. These are all incredible um, words of wisdom. And I definitely agree and reflect all those. I think that for me, it took, it feels like decades <laughs> to get to where I am today. And if I were to see myself 10 years ago with all the anxieties of like, what am I going to do? Um, it just wouldn't seem possible sort of where I am now. So I think that like for younger mus uh, musicians or those who are on this panel, I was definitely in your shoes and situations like maybe just trying to find a way to navigate the world. And I think that courage sort of involves this belief that you have something to offer that no one else can. And how do you amplify that as much as possible? How do you develop skills, disciplines? How do you find mentors, friends, and supporters to be able to uh, help you along the way? And I think that for me, as I saw it from that framework, I was able to develop like a community that felt like they could lift me up in that way. Um, and just surrounding yourself with um, folks who um, affirm uh, might, you know, sometimes give you a little bit of a, a hard time, uh, but you know, it's coming from a, from a place of love um, and, and just trusting in not only yourself, but all these folks who have gotten you to where you are in this moment. You are a product of that belief of, of people who only see the best of who you can be. Uh, so spend as much time with them as possible. They say that like you are like the five closest people to you in your life, whoever you spend that time with. So for me, it's like I want to make sure that those people are 
good people. Yeah, like there are like Facebook groups, there's Israelability, there's the group Edwin and Princess ON, there's the whole community waiting for you guys and cheering you up and that's when you and helping you. You know, these guys stole all the good stuff again. So, you know, I really don't really have much to say besides just keep fighting, keep asking for help and believe in yourself because we all believe in you. And that's all I have to say. That is some great advice, Allie. Thank you. So I just wanted to say thank you to Adrian, Allie, Emily, and Precious for taking the time out of their busy schedules to be on this panel. We really appreciate it. And Donna, is there any other announcements that I should be aware about at this point? No, Eric, just wanna say thank you again to all of our wonderful presenters today. You guys were amazing. Thank you for taking the time to be with us and to celebrate DD Awareness Month and to honor all of the wonderful artists out there and all of us artist wannabes. Thank you for inspiring all of us to think about art as uh, a part of our everyday lives. Thank you for reminding us how to breathe and inspire ourselves and others. I hope we will all be able to do that. Thank you again to everybody for joining us. I'm sorry we're out of time for questions, um, but thank you everybody. Take care. <laughs>